Welcome to this journey where we dialogue with thought and heart leaders to share their reflections on human condition and how to improve them. Today we have with us Dr. Kundan Singh. Dr. Kundan Singh is former co-faculty at Sofia University, USA. He is currently a co-doctoral faculty with the Hindu University of America, Florida, where he is developing a new field of study titled Post-Colonial Hindu Studies. Dr. Kundan Singh holds a doctorate in Humanities with a concentration in East-West Psychology from the California Institute of Integral Studies. Earlier, he obtained an MA in Applied Psychology with a concentration in Social Psychology from the University of Delhi, India. Yeah, so the question is, uh, how are you thinking through this? How are you, uh, when you look around, there are different phenomena happening at different scales and geographies and different disciplines talking about it. And yeah. How are you looking at the phenomenon? How are you trying to make sense of this? See, epidemics are not something new to humankind. You know, they have been happening for a very long period of time, and invariably they happen, right? But earlier, the world was not so interconnected as it is today. So you would have epidemics. You know, you would not have a pandemic. Now you actually have a pandemic, you know, it originated in a particular region and in no time it basically spread to different parts of the world, right? So it's a pandemic and, you know, interestingly, before coming to this conversation, I was watching your interaction with uh, Dr. Anirban Bandhapadhyay. And, you know, I was looking at some of the data that he's uh, speaking about, you know, particularly with respect to the growth of coronavirus in different human populations. And of course, you know, um, I, the conversation happened on 20th of March, I guess. So, yes. you know, his graphs were basically uh, pertaining to period before 20th of March. But I don't think, you know, anything has significantly shifted. So the coronavirus, you know, has definitely uh, varied itself in different human populations uh, across regions. And, you know, the jury is still out on how, you know, it is going to pan out in different parts of the world. Uh, that remains to be seen. And I'm sure, you know, there will be a lot of data analysis you know, after uh, this pandemic is over, which brings me to the point that I'm very hopeful that it will be over as have been the other ones in the past. You know, it's going to go through its own cycle and it will subside. I'm particularly pleased with, you know, the, uh, the measures that have been taken by government of India in checking the spread. And uh, today is what, 27th of March, 27th of March here in California and 28th of March in India. Uh, it seems that the curve is already flattening. So, you know, of course we need to uh, observe it for the next couple of weeks and see how uh, things go. But to tell you very honestly, in my own heart, in my own being, I'm hopeful that it will subside. You know, unfortunately, it will take some lives away. And, uh, you know, and it will inf infect a lot of people. Uh, fortunately, again, you know, not everybody who gets infected by this virus basically dies. So there is a silver lining in the cloud, if you will. So that's, you know, that's where I am poised at this point in time. And, uh, you know, basically observing how things are going to pan out. Interesting. In I'm a little upset, I must tell you, I'm a little upset by the fact, you know, uh, that China uh, was not as proactive 
as it could ha could have been, you know, with respect to checking its spread in the outside world. I'm sure you know it took good measures, you know, within its own population. But uh, the very fact that it, uh, uh, you know, hid the revelation of information to the wider world, you know, for a good number of days uh, has also led to the spread of pandemic. <laughs> and I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. Noted. Um, so a couple of points you raised in the, in the conversation. Uh, uh, there have been, they have, so obviously when, when we look at any phenomena and when we look at measures taken to address them, if, if the phenomena was some sort of a crisis or an anticipated crisis, then you would have people that people across the spectrum, you know, some lauding it because they see it in a certain light and then some obviously seeing it in a different light and they may have a different view. So one of the school, which is on this side, which is having a slightly different view is around the whole idea of testing. Uh, the, 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 the simple thesis there being that we aren't testing enough. So we don't really know uh, how many carriers are there in the population as of now. And suppose if we start testing, uh, there could be a different kind of a view that might emerge. Now, that is nothing to take away from the measures that have been taken. And I think they have been they have been really, really uh, forward-looking and very. Uh, I, I think I think India has surpassed all those kind of things when we compare this to any other country that has that has really tried to uh, address it. How do you weigh in on something like this? See. There's a problem with testing also. If you have people, you know, concentrated at one place where they come for testing, or if you have people concentrated at various places where they're coming for testing, that also can allow the spread of the virus. You know, the unfortunate part with this virus is that it spreads very quickly, right? So, you know, the, the quarantine which has been imposed at this point in time is really good. And I think, you know, given that India is a collectivist society by and large, you know, uh, most people are not alone. So, you know, if they begin to show symptoms, you know, I think the family members can definitely take proactive measures, right? In getting the person tested or getting the family tested and taking measures so that they get cured and ensure that they do not cause the spread of the virus. Right. And I think what you're hinting at is the, 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 the nature of this pandemic is, is unprecedented in the world right now. So uh, uh, not, only, not only does it demand, and India being such a vast country in itself, right. it's such, a, such a densely populated country, with its own set of trajectory in terms of how the country is progressing as a population. Uh, and then add to it the, that the virus itself is mutating. Uh, or perhaps there is a there is a likelihood of the virus mutating because there have been strains tested in different countries and it shows that the virus is showing slightly different slight variations in different geographies. So, yeah. uh, so I I take your point uh, on that. Um, you know, as as uh, Dr. Anirban Bandopadhyay was saying, that the vi viruses are usually stupid. But this virus, you know, seems to be very intelligent. intelligent. Yeah, yeah. And this yeah. has been, yeah, please go ahead. No, it's okay. You know, that's yeah. fine. Yeah, you wanted to say something. Yeah. And in fact, uh, uh, two, two points here. Point one is the, 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 the adaptability of the virus itself. And the point two of certain forewarnings being uh, sounded off. Uh, none less than Bill Gates in 2015. You know, there is a there's a TED talk which which was already highly viewed back then, but now it's going even more uh, with a viewing because uh, Bill Gates 
in that TED talk is clearly talking about that we are not prepared for any kind of a pandemic. And just a couple of days back, I think he was interviewed by the TED founder. And he was, he was asked this very simple question, your TED talk came, uh, do you think it was completely ignored or did we do enough? And his answer was, yes, we did not do enough. Um, uh, any, any views around, around that? Any, anything that's coming up for you for something like that? Well, you know, given the havoc that this virus has wreaked, it's very clear that the, pre the preparedness was not there in humankind. There should have been, for sure, you know, because it's, it's not you know, the natural cause of uh, these epidemics, uh, which is the concern at this point in time. But we definitely do know that, uh, you know, there are countries that are involved in the creation of biological weapons. I'm not saying, you know, that this virus is biological weapon, you know, I'm certainly not saying that, you know, I'm not qualified to actually <clears throat> give my opinion one way or the other, you know, on this virus. But it certainly is a common knowledge that countries are involved in the creation of biological weapons, right? So given that the preparedness should have been there, but it seems that this virus has caught the entire humankind off guard. Certainly things are going to change, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much sure. A lot, lot of changes are going to happen in humankind because of the advent of this virus. Things will certainly shift. But these will be after the fact. You know, even there were some people who were anticipating something like this. The governments, you know, for their own reasons, had not put things in place. Right. Um, uh, interesting insight that you build in uh, saying that there is there is a heightened awareness, there was a heightened awareness that there are biological weapons under development and that could be a potential threat for any nation and hence the hence a natural expectation that the nation should ideally have been nations should have been ideally more prepared uh, with their resources and this clearly has uh, caught most of us off guard um, right. yeah. Uh, the, the couple of things then that get nuanced there, one is at the level of the institutions and at the level of the individual, um, because we've constructed these, because there is this in our evolution as a civilization, we have these institutions across the world and now institutions uh, developing policy response uh, for a vast majority of population. Uh, do you think this this is a natural do you think this is a natural constraint or a natural bridge for a response like this because today when i talk to a lot of individuals a lot of individuals want to contribute towards uh, uh, fighting or getting back uh, uh, but they are not able to participate in the system though i must also i must also laud that a lot of governments are now inviting people from across the ecosystem scientists, industrialists, individuals, techies, and all of that. Uh, but do you think that this, uh, this institution and individual, which was always there in the mankind, the institutions would have been in a different form, but the today's form of the institution and individual needs a relook or a reimagination? See, there are a couple of things which are certainly emerging. One is that we are badly interconnected. 
right? And most disciplines, you know, they have become interdisciplinary. Now, you know, from perspective of Vedantic spirituality, this is very significant. Because Vedanta, you know, since the Upanishads has basically been saying that this entire cosmos of which the universe is a part has basically manifested out of one single entity. It has, it's basically one which has manifested itself in multiple ways and has become the tremendous plurality that you experience in the universe. Rocks, stones, rivers, trees, worms, animals, bats, human beings, dogs, what not. They all are interconnected. And they basically come from one single source. It's basically that one single source which has multiplied itself in innumerable ways. I do not know, you know, how seriously the humankind is going to take into account this oneness and interdependence after this pandemic is over. My hope is that it does. Because if it does, then, you know, as human civilization, we will be, we'll be making huge strides towards interdependence and interconnectedness. You know, we need to realize that you cannot be happy or you cannot be prosperous if others are unhappy and are living lives full of misery. It doesn't happen that way. You know, as they say, what goes around comes around. So basically, you know, any good thought, or let me put it this way, you know, even one good thought, if you send it out into the system, basically comes to you. And when I'm saying this, you know, I'm not being superstitious, unscientific, or philosophical. I'm saying this because I have critically examined the philosophy of science over a period of time. I have studied science, you know, I've understood, I've, I've known what science is, what its philosophical underpinnings are. For, for the benefit yeah, this, of... Yeah, let me complete this point, you know. <clears throat> Sure. Like at this point in time, what is massively rampant in science is the philosophy of positivism. Now positivism, as an assumption, says that only that is real, which can be accessed through five senses. Not even your mind. Only that is real, which can be accessed the five senses. Anything which cannot be accessed by five senses is not real and it does not exist. Right? But if you look at various spiritual traditions, most of them belonging to India, say that there is a reality which can be accessed by transcending your senses and mind. And this reality, over a period of time, has been accessed by many people. 
in the Indian context, we call them rishis. Right? This reality, let's say, for instance, you know, which Vedanta talks about, has been verified by countless people and also replicated by certain people in their own experience. Right? But is this experience, you know, available to everyone? No, it's not. Is quantum physics available to anyone? It's not, I'm sorry. You have to have a certain kind of disposition and training in order to become quantum physicist. So in order to become a yogi or a mystic, you need to have certain qualifications. In principle, you know, everyone can become a yogi or a quantum physicist. But both these fields, they require certain qualification. Right? So what I'm saying is that there are certain truths that have been spoken about for a very long period of time. Within the Indian context, and they have been verified in other contexts also. For instance, Sufism and Christian mysticism. That you know, these truths also need to be taken seriously. Just like, you know, in order to become a scientist, you investigate the field or you become a scientist by the parameters that are defined by science in order to become a mystic or a yogi. You can only do so if you follow the principles which are outlined in the field. But what happens, unfortunately, Hemant, is that a lot of people, you know, a priorly dismiss the field of knowledge, which has come to us, you know, for an extended period of time. And they have their own validity. It's not that they don't have the validity, you know. But I'll stop here and then, you know, I will continue with the, with a very interesting thing, you know, which I discovered today with respect to, you know, coronavirus and uh, the world of spirituality. But, you know, but I saw that you had a couple of questions, you know, I can come to this point later. So, uh... I think you beautifully uh, tried to attempt at uh, uh, linking the institution versus individual from the lens of interdependency and how the interdependency uh, seems to be in a, going in a certain direction, but it can, it can ideally go in another direction. And from that sense, you also try to uh, look at the origins of these interdependency actually coming from a single source and how there is pluralism that is developed over a period of time from a single source you have project I mean you have these different uh, species and different forms life forms that yes. have evolved over a period of time yes. and suddenly now you find now we find ourselves in this uh, uh, in this era where humanity collectively has developed so much of enterprise that it's threatening the existence coexistence of other life forms in some sense uh, not only its own life form, but the other life forms as well. Um, a couple of things that came up there was uh, at the at the level of a human being, uh, there are there are possible experiences. If I were to just use that word as a placeholder for time being, and those possible experiences have a spectrum. So at the level of let's say emotions, we can have jealousy we can have compassion we can have joy we can have 
uh, friend, friend, friendliness, we can have ego, we can have pride, insecurity, so on and so forth. Now, these are possibilities that are already there with the individual. And um, how, how, do you, how do you try to see this? Uh, because when you mention what goes around comes around in that sense uh, and that people ideally should be happy only when the other is happy but then you have jealousy I'm just bringing in an example uh, you know just for the sake of uh, dialogue that you have a sadistic behavior you have some people feeling happy because of somebody else's uh, distress and that's also a sort of an app which is already installed in all of us. Uh, but yes, to a varying degree, we have a disposition to it and we can cultivate skills to dial it down. How would you respond? No, to in fact, you know, you can transform it. Though all the negative emotions that you're talking about, you know, is present in humankind. Not everyone is susceptible to it. That also is a reality. And if one is susceptible to it, you know, let's uh, think for a moment. That particular individual can engage in certain practices and completely transform it. In fact, you know, the transformation of all kinds of negative emotions is very much a part of the Indian spiritual traditions. You know, I'm not talking about different traditions because my I'm not well well read in those fields, you know, but definitely the world of Vedanta, Buddhism, Jainism, you know, and Sufism to a considerable extent, you know, I have delved into. So I am, you know, I'm definitely familiar with the focus which is there in these traditions towards the transformation of these negative human emotions. And you would be surprised to know that, you know, negative human associations also have a connection with some of the things that we are experiencing today. How? You know, let me again go back to the world of Vedanta. So Vedanta, you know, of course, talks about one single entity. It talks about, you know, the manifestation of plurality and diversity and multiplicity from oneness. And at the same time, it also says that there are different planes of consciousness that have manifested out of that one. And what are these planes of consciousness? The physical plane of consciousness under my kosha. The vital or emotional plane of consciousness, prana my kosha. The mental plane of consciousness, mano my kosha. The plane of intuitive consciousness or vijnana my kosha. the plane of blissful consciousness or anandamaya kosha. You know, of course, these are loose translations. You know, it's, it's not that these Sanskrit words, you know, are completely captured in these English translations. But these various planes of consciousness are present in human beings. Annamay Kosha basically gives you your body. Pranamay Kosha engenders your world of emotions. Manomay Kosha is your, melt your mental consciousness. At this point in time, you know, at least these planes of consciousness are present in all human beings. 
their other two vigyan mein and anand mein that are beyond these three and essentially in order to get to those levels of consciousness and ultimately you know your oneness with brahm you basically need to transcend your mental consciousness you have to try and transcend your mind but see this pranamay kosha plays a very important role in our lives this is where you know all the positive and negative emotions lie so what becomes important you know in terms of spiritual practices that all those negative emotions they have to be purified you know different indian traditions deal with them in different ways you know some talk about perfecting them some talk about transcending them and so on and so forth you know but there is definitely unanimity amongst all these traditions where they say that all the negative emotions they have to be transcended you know all these negative emotions they create certain vibrations and if there is a very strong bad will you know which is which is present then that gives rise to microbes and germs let me explain this to you you know when an individual passes away when he or she dies what happens is that you know that individual basically drops the the physical body other bodies you know they are not dropped right away so for some time you know they have these various sheets around them sometimes what happens is that you know these beings who have just died are not able to go past the vital world this world is the world of ghosts pisachas rakshasas and so on and so forth some benign beings and some very hostile beings over a period of time you know these vital beings they undergo a certain kind of disintegration and it is basically this disintegration which leads to the creation of microbes and if that microbe has a particularly very strong bad will behind it then it causes something like an epidemic or a pandemic you would ask me you know where you where are you getting this information from no in fact no i i won't go to the source part of it maybe i'll reason it through and try to understand it through differently <laughs> right right yeah. right so i'll give you the I... source also okay I'll, i'll give you the source also okay so right behind me you know you would must be seeing two pictures you know yes so <clears throat> these are the pictures of shorobindo and the mother you know perhaps you would know and i'm sure you know many of your viewers would know that shorobindo you know was a mystic philosopher par excellence and mother you know she was she was also a very very powerful mystic uh <laughs> you know given that this conversation is not about shorobindo and the mother you know i would sort of stop here but one of one of the books you know that has been compiled from the writings of the mother is this health and healing in yoga so you know the mother is basically talking about the various dimensions 
that are involved in the creation of a disease and various measures that can actually be used for the cure of the disease. Now, interestingly, you know, there's another thing, you know, which mother talks about. And she says that these, my, these microbes, they're vibrations. They're essentially vibrations, you know, of bad will. And as I was getting ready for this conversation, you know, I came across an article which was published about 10 years ago in a scientific journal, which says that vibrations can kill viruses 10 years ago. So for the sake of your viewers, you know, I would actually want to read a few things from that particular. Please, article. please do, please do. Right? So, should I share my screen? Yeah, and yeah, please, should please. We, do that. Should we read it together? Yeah, we can do that. I'll need to, uh, yeah, you can do that. Let's do that. I'll need to make some adjustment on the, um, okay, so I'll need to make some adjustment on uh, the screen because the recording is happening in a different way. Right. Think it should be difficult. No, I'll just quickly read it and then, you know. Yeah. I'll, I'll, just... I'll remove the screen sharing. So this was, you know, this was um, uh, published one, on fifth of February two thousand eight. One second, one second. I'm still, I'm just adjusting the screen because my current screen doesn't capture yes. this. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm just trying to adjust it so that we are there, maybe. Yes, please go ahead. So, you know, this, uh, this particular write-up is titled New Way to Kill Viruses. Shake them to death. It goes something like this. Scientists may one day be able to destroy viruses in the same way that opera singers presumably shatter wine glasses. New research mathematically determined the frequencies at which simple viruses could be shaken to death. So basically, you know, what is involved here is the principle of resonance. And <laughs> resonance can only happen, you know, if an entity has a particular frequency, it frequency. Is vibrating at a particular frequency level, right? So the moment, you know, resonance occurs, the virus basically gets dis destroyed. And this is, you know, this is what the study is actually contending. So it says further, the capsid of a virus is something like the shell of a turtle said physicist Otto Sankey of Arizona State University. If the shell can be compromised by mechanical vibrations, the virus can be inactivated. Recent experimental evidence has also shown laser pulses turned to the right frequency can, can kill certain viruses, uh, viruses. However, locating these so-called resonant frequencies is a bit of trial and error. It's completely understandable, right? right? You know, I mean, one cannot really know at the level, you know, a, a, a virus is basically vibrating, right? Experiments must just try a wide variety of conditions and hope that conditions are found that can lead to success, Sankey told Life Science. To expedite the search, Sankey and his student, Eric Dykman, have developed a way to calculate the vibrational motion of every atom in a virus shell. From this, they can determine the lowest resonant frequencies. As an example of their technique, the T 
team modeled the satellite tobacco necrosis virus and found the small virus resonates strongly around 60 gigahertz. This is as per, you know, physical review letters. I will stop sharing screen Hemant, at this point in time. Yeah, and just give me one more second because I'll try to just readjust the screen once again. Please, please. Yes, I think we can start right. Yeah. Right. So, so, uh, go so ahead. you know, vibrations can destroy viruses, right? Now, let me take you to something which happened, you know, not too long ago. Right before Janta curfew, right? Modi ji said that, you know, that we should ban Pali's, you know, uh, uh, have countries around and so on and so forth, right? And I can tell you, there were a lot of people, you know, who were saying that this approach is, is, highly, is, is highly unscientific, right? I'm not saying, you know, whether he knows the science behind this or not. You know, I'm not, I'm not certain about this. But I definitely do know that in our temples, you have these bells. And you know, and you're expected to ring the bell when you enter. Of course, you know, people never knew, you know, why we ring the bell. But certain people from within the tradition, you know, have also been saying that vibrations kill viruses. And of course, you know, in India, it's a very unfortunate situation that the moment you talk anything about the science of the tradition, you know, you are immediately labeled bhakta, dim and so on and so forth, you know, which is absolutely stupid, you know, to tell you very honestly. Because science never says that you have come to the finality of anything. Science basically means, you know, constant exploration of the universe. Which basically means that at some point in time, you know, the boundaries that have been defined by science at this point in time also will need to be transcended in order for the scientific activity to continue. That certainly does not mean that science is all bogus. Certainly not. You know, all the issues that were raised by Dr. Bandopadhyay in your conversation with respect to how, you know, <clears throat> virus uh, or rather coronavirus, you know, really attacks the human organism will not get invalidated by what is being said. In fact, you know, what, what set me thinking, I'll tell you this, you know, it's not that... Uh, <clears throat> you know, I chanced upon this piece of research paper. There was one particular thing that he said. He said that, you know, when the, when the virus is trying to attach itself to the human cell, it bangs itself at a very high speed. And I was like, oh, you know, this could be because of a certain vibration that it carries. And then, you know, I connected that with what the mother is saying, that microbes are essentially vibrations of bad will, you know, from a different realm, which is not visible to the naked eye. And I started doing my research and I come across this particular article. So what I'm saying is that people who believe in science, you know, should not become religious, should not become dogmatic. It's very important, you know, that people keep the pores of their mind and the spirit of inquiry, you know, which science propagates going. 
there's no finality to science. It's very important that we remember that. You know, at this point in time, if you look at it from the Vedantic perspective, we are only exploring the Annamaya Kosha. There are other Koshas that need to be explored. And all these different Koshas are interconnected with one another. You see what I'm saying? So what, you know, what molecular scientists are discovering will not get invalidated by what the spiritualists are saying. If the molecular biologists, you know, or molecular scientists, they have hit upon the truth of something. There's a connection, there's a complementarity, there's interdependence. You know, there are, there are layers to truth. Yes. So uh, I think you covered quite a distance in this. And in fact, it becomes difficult to then, because there are so many things that you pack in there. It, it's difficult to, because the memory can only carry a few things. So uh, that's the reason I insisted that if we can just halt it here. Um, a couple of things. So I am completely with you that there is something, I, I, I would imagine that there is something, something that would be called a bad science and something called as a adaptive good science. And the adaptive good science would be open to, ideas open to plurality, uh, open to testing them, open to causality, correlations, both the level of thesis and the level of experimentation, and yet also being open that some things will not be accessible right now, and there could be some discoveries coming along the way. Uh, yeah. And not, 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 uh, I am completely with you where people discredit any other form of knowledge and disparage it in a very, very uh, uh, unparliamentary way. I'm completely yeah. against it. Yeah. I, think where, I think where it goes perhaps a little on the tangent is when, when these things get discussed and when one wants to have meaningful, curious, curiosity-led dialogue, the, perhaps the other side, Whoever the other side, whether it's the person representing spirituality or representing science or representing knowledge of both, I think there is there is less of patience to nuance and reason it through, and yet be aware that you may still not be able to transfer what you know to the other, and yet be comfortable with it. And yet respect what is coming and what is being said. So I think that is what is missing today, uh, 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 as I see, because even among scientists, I, I think scientists, again, are not homogeneous. There is a heterogeneous lot. And there are quite a lot of scientists doing these very research. In fact, the research that you pointed out is, is, all, is, is testifying what Mother said, in a way. And yeah. uh, I see it as a, as, a, as a positive step taken by science to give some semblance to what has been written by a realized being on the planet. Yeah. See, if, if I were a microbiologist at this point in time, you know, and if I were doing research on coronavirus, I would actually see, you know, if uh, the ringing of the bells is making any, any effect. It's, you know, it can, it can just be taken to a laboratory setting, right? You can, yeah. Absolutely. It can be tested. Experiments can be run. And on. see, the thing is that, you know, I, and I really want that, <clears throat> Dr. Anirban Bandapadhyay, you know, actually sees this conversation so that, you know, he can actually test. And let's say, for instance, you know, if this simple exercise attenuates the virus very, very quickly, you know, if it gets proven, just imagine, you know, but just, just by ringing bells, you know, it's like we will be able to kind of bring this epidemic, uh, I won't say under control, you know, but, you know, we will obstruct this, the spread yeah. of this it's, virus. You know, it, it may happen. It can happen, right? Absolutely. I'm not saying that, you know, that people should not be exploring the world of medicine and all the other good, wonderful things, you know, which scientists and philosophers are doing. I'm not, I'm certainly not saying. 
But what I'm saying is that, you know, even this can be brought into the mix. Totally with you. In fact, if I were to just take this for, for the next few minutes with you and, yes, please. and how I am looking at it, and you can, you can, you can question if I'm looking at it in a, in a, in a deviant way or a different way. So when you say that, and uh, in fact, here, you're aware that, you know, WhatsApp is becoming the, the news platform for most of the people. And it's very, really, it's very difficult to verify what information is really a reasoned scientific kind of a view. And I'm not using the word scientific from the, from the, from the conventional use of the word science, but from a reasoned perspective point of view. Uh, so if I were to look at the experiment that was done, Paanch Bajay, Paanch Minute, I think it was a beautiful, beautiful experiment. Now, if I were to then say that that experiment had a lot of uh, nature, it had certain uh, intended consequences and unintended consequences, and I can fill up those both uh, things that there were certain unintended consequences caused by it. There were some, some intended consequences that were caused by it. But then if I were to link back and saying that um, the claps, the thalis, the conch cells, the whistles, the bells generate a certain kind of frequency, people at different distance generating it. So there would be some kind of a phenomena that would be, you know, because they all frequencies would come and create a field of itself. And what kind of impact does it have on different scales of our existence, right from this virus to, to another form of virus or another form of bacteria? So there is, this is absolutely a scientific, uh, I mean, I'm no scientist, so I should just say that from my limited understanding, there is a testability, as you pointed out, somebody can test it. And then one can also look at a control condition where that is not there and how this is behaving. So you have daily noise and hustles going around, gadi ki awaz ya koi bhi awaz, they are also generating vibrations. And how is that responding to the virus itself? And it's a it's a it's a fair scientific experiment one can design it and publish a research around it it's totally with absolutely. you absolutely see the thing is that you know my i am not going into the validity you know or the problems of the experiment which was conducted you know between 5 and 5 pm and 505 5 pm you know i'm 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 not going there all that I'm saying is that these bells, you know, which have been there in temples, they have been there for a certain reason. And in fact, you know, in, in these temples, you just cannot put any bell. All these bells, you know, they have a certain constitution. They're made of different elements, you know, different metals. Yes. And they're basically alloys. Right. And, you know, and the percentage of different uh, metals, you know, are sort of fixed. So, you, you, you know, so what I'm saying is that, you know, when, of course, when a lot of people come together and they start, you know, banging things, I, I don't think, you know, uh, <laughs> or let me put it this way, you know, only noise will get generated. So, you know, and whether that noise is going to affect, you know, the virus or not, I'm, I do not know about it. But it's a, it's a scientific once, experiment. Yeah, definitely. It. Definitely. These are certain things, you know, that need to be tested. So, which is, which is my next question, actually. In fact, yesterday, somebody forwarded something on WhatsApp. Uh, right. some, some surgeon or a scientist in India wrote right. an open letter to the Prime Minister and he was pained. And his pain was that while we are going through such a huge crisis, uh, why aren't we looking at alternate mechanisms to test and see if we can also use that as an armament to fight this virus? So his point was, we have Ministry of Ayush, right? Yeah. It's a ministry in itself. And we have so many scientists in India. Why aren't we tapping into those resources? Now, I should also hold myself back. Look, the Prime Minister has only limited bandwidth to communicate right now. Maybe it's happening and maybe we don't know. So, uh, or maybe it's not your, happening. Your, your voice went in and out. You know, I was not able to. Your okay. voice went in and out. I could not hear your point. So 
could you please repeat you know a couple of uh, sentences you were saying something about ayush yeah please yeah so i'm saying there is ayush which yeah. was formed with a certain mandate and mission mode yeah. and in this time of crisis uh, this doctor's pain his open letter was saying uh, why aren't we tapping into alternate mechanisms to apprehend this virus and figure out a mechanism to contain it why not have this as an armament along with whatever we are doing in terms of the allopathic or other pursuits so the point i was making is maybe it's happening maybe we don't know about it maybe it has not been spoken up spoken about right. but the question that i have the curiosity that i have kundan ji is you lay out a very interesting case you discovered something in the morning and it is a fair scientific experiment the point is where do you take this and whom do you take this to let's say we take it to anirban and i'm i'm assuming he would i, I would personally give him a call after this call uh, but then there there could be other sources other other labs other people who could be looking at this and just taking in and running these experiments so do you see there is a dearth of this kind of a channel where you know there is there is the lack of this interface and the resources to run these kind of experiments you know i personally think you know this is very simple just isolate the virus right and just ring some bells around it you know and see if something happens right yeah yeah that's all i mean one thing is for certain you know it has been identified very clearly that you know viruses get killed after they are subjected you know to vibrations at a certain level through the method of or through phenomena of resonance that has already been accomplished so all that we need to do you know or find is that you know are these frequencies that get generated you know through the ringing of bells at all effective in you know in doing something to the virus yeah negatively you know i'm not saying that it will it can only go ahead and kill it you know even if it attenuates it that would be an accomplishment and then what happens is that you know that in your armory of combating this menace you have added one more approach just like you know it has been discovered that chloroquine is effective both as a preventive uh, you know factor as well as or rather and curative factor towards you know this virus this also can be added yeah. why not just just a qualification because uh, just just a small qualification here that uh, the last few days of uh, the press briefing by the uh, health secretary love agarwal mm -hmm. i think uh he he is he is advising people to use it only under certain prescription and only two categories of people are allowed to use a form of chloroquine in india as of now yeah. uh so you know just just because you know this is a medical kind of an information no no it's very important i'm glad that you're doing it you know because yeah. you know it's pe people will be watching it and they should definitely not get correct you know, wrong information You know, so this the use of just, this i was just giving an example you know just i was just saying that you know that researchers are saying that this is effective you know yes so yes. i'm glad that you know that you clarified i think you should clarify it even more clearly you know yeah uh, so, so that so you know people do not uh, take wrong measures this kind of thing yeah. yeah by listening to our conversation yes yeah so i was you know i was just wondering if you could please repeat you know the yeah. the information that you have received from uh, ministry of health yesterday yeah so uh, the health secretary has been doing press briefing every day almost and in the last few days of press briefing they have announced that for uh, two categories i'm not getting the categories right but two categories and i'll put the i'll put the links to the uh, footnotes of this conversation but only two categories of people are allowed to use a variant of chloroquine it's not just the chlor chloroquine that there's a particular hydroxy i'm not getting the name right again but there's a variant of chloroquine which is allowed only for two categories of people and no other category so people cannot rush and buy it off the shelf from the 
from from the shops it's prohibited and anybody engaging in such kind of activity will be booked under the necessary act in india as far as the india right. thing right. is concerned yeah right right no thank you for clarifying that yeah. Uh, but I see what you're saying. What you're saying is plurality again. I think I think uh, one of the tones that I have always heard, uh, you know, going back to our conversations earlier before this interaction, you've been you've been constantly thinking beyond the binary, beyond the beyond the uh, the, the narrow scientific temper, but an open scientific temper towards things. So uh, so this is again, I think uh, I think very consistent with that line of thinking. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you know, from in our <clears throat> past conversations, you are familiar with the fact that I've done a lot of work, you know, around binaries and how binaries actually operate and so on and so forth, you know. Uh, <clears throat> so, yes, you know, um, it was only because of the transcendence of binaries that, you know, that I could basically uh, develop this approach. And... Uh, and what it has done for me is that, you know, I can look at many different approaches simultaneously without privileging one over the other. You know, because truth has many, diff many layers, right? And all those layers, you know, can be explored. And all those layers, uh, <clears throat> can be very effective at a given point in time. So I'm pretty much sure that even, you know, uh, <clears throat> the universe of coronavirus uh, I've lost your, I've lost your audio. Just one second. Can you, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's now. Around. Can you repeat yeah. the last sentence, please? Yeah. So I was saying that, uh, you know, there can be multiple approaches in tackling a problem. And all those approaches could be simultaneously true if they are tapping into the truth of that situation. Like, I'll just give you an example, you know, again, from the Vedantic perspective. The health of a human being, you know, is completely not dependent on what happens in his or her physical body, in his or her, you know, in his or her anna kosha. Certainly not. There are certain things, you know, happening in prana kosha. There are things happening in Manomai kosha. There are things happening in Vidyan mai kosha. There are things happening, you know, in Anandamaya Anandamaya kosha. And let's say, for instance, you know, that there is one particular scientist, you know, who is just exploring the world of uh, the Anandamaya kosha. He or she will land into a certain understanding of truth behind the issue. There's, there could be another individual, you know, who's, who's only exploring mm -hmm. the pranam kosha. He or she will look at the truth of the situation, you know, from that particular vantage point. We can multiply, multiply these examples, you know, to all the other planes of consciousness. But we cannot say that, you know, that somebody, uh, you know, who, who has discovered certain truths, you know, within the physical body has a greater hold on truth than the individual who has figured out something in the pranamaya kosha. It is in so... In fact, at this point in time, you know, mind-body medicine Go ahead, go ahead. Hello. Yeah. So I was saying that, you know, in fact, 
these days, <clears throat> the world of mind-body medicine has become quite prevalent, right? Why? Because people are looking, are, are seeing the interdependence of mind and body. In my understanding, that also is a limited field. Why? You know, because the Pranamaya Kosha is not in operation. The Vigyanamaya Kosha is not in operation. The Anandamaya Kosha is not in operation. It is so fascinating. You uh, what you're invoking is is uh, is a systemic systemic view in the sense interdependency again. You know which we were discussing early on in the conversation, and it's it's you know it's fascinating. So I've been watching ads, the commercial ads now, and how they're turning and talking to this pandemic. So you find a mattress ad saying how sleep is important because sleep will generate certain proteins sleep will give you x y z and that will help you find find the virus you get a hand wash company saying something and that's also saying you'll find the virus you'll have an entertainment company saying that if you're happy and you know entertain you'll be able to find the virus now if mm -hmm. we were to just if you were to strain them and put them all as a as a system and they're all talking to virus but all of them are talking at different consciousness different layers of our consciousness and That's they all are true they are all <laughs> they all are true they all are true yeah that's yeah. you know that's that's the that's the interesting thing and see the thing is that the moment you get beyond this true false binary a whole different world of exploration actually opens correct you know your 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 consciousness with respect to exploration of truth that itself gets broadened Correct. Like, you know, from the perspective of uh, spirituality, it is extreme, it's, it's extremely important that people don't get fearful. You know, the mother says that if you become fearful, you will attract the contagion. So one of the best ways of not getting sick at this point in time is not becoming fearful. But that certainly does not mean that one should become stupid. You know, it should certainly not mean that one should not practice social distancing. Right? I mean, those things can happen simultaneously, as can happen not becoming fearful of the situation. Yeah. In fact, what you just mentioned, again, if one were to look at from a systemic design thinking, mind mapping, interdependency mode, then suppose we, we hold fearful here just as a placeholder and then look at the food we consume. So it is it has been established by science uh, and, and various other things that when you are in stress and in fear, you consume not a very conscious kind of food and not even consciously consuming it. In a sense, the, the food itself, the choice of food itself is different and the way you consume it is completely different. Right? and how it affects your body is different. Then at the level of uh, mind, if the fear app is constantly working, it would generate certain neurotransmitters uh, uh, that, could be, that could be leading towards a faster contraction or the dial down of the immune response to the virus in some sense. Um, at the other level, if you become fearful, you become too hoarding. So you start hoarding stuff and you don't think about the society that they may need something and, you know, the mask may be more useful for somebody else rather than you just holding certain masks. So I think at every level, the fear can be played out and you can look at these different planes of consciousness or well-beings of existence and you can have manifestations of behavior. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Brilliant. So, um, How are you navigating this on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, what's happening in your own daily schedule? <clears throat> See, I had a very interesting conversation with a friend of mine today. So, you know, <clears throat> California also is under lockdown. Yeah. So, you know, both of us 
uh, are very philosophically oriented people, you know. We tend to live more in the inner world than in the outer world. So I was telling him, what lockdown? You know, I have been under lockdown for a very long period of time. <laughs> Self-chosen self or self-imposed? <laughs> 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 and you know, and the reason why I'm saying this is because there's so much to do. You know, um, I won't go into the details, but you are aware of the kind of intellectual work that I've been doing over a period of time. You know, I don't really have uh, much time, you know, to wander about. In any case, right? So personally, nothing much has shifted. You know, it's just that when I go to get my grocery, you know, I'm a little careful with respect to the things that I'm just touching and so on and so forth. But other than that, you know, not much has really changed in my life. Though, you know, I really wish that this situation comes to an end as quickly as possible. Because it is causing an inordinate amount of suffering to a lot of people, right? So my prayer definitely goes to the divine that, you know, that this subsides as quickly as possible. And as few people as possible get affected by this, right? So that's, you know, that's how I'm looking at the situation. And as I said at the beginning of our conversation, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that this would end soon. And maybe that's an optimistic note for us to uh, call this conversation as as a as a temporary halt, and maybe we can reconvene sometime next week to take forward this conversation. Sure, I would love to. I would love love to. It's always great, you know, to have a freewheeling conversation, you know, uh, with no explicitly uh, no explicit agenda in front, you know. And then what happens is that things get co-created. And that's the wonderful aspect, you know, about having an open conversation, I guess, you know. Yes, yes. Where, <clears throat> where the parameters have not been set from the get-go. Yes. Absolutely. And I really cherish this conversation, this time, this warmth, this presence that you gifted us with. Thank you so much. And I really hope that, you know, that when people uh, hear this, you know, they basically get benefit from this conversation. And I really hope that, you know, that some scientists also listen to this and they do their own experiments. Mm -hmm.